Welcome to Post Break. My name is Chris Peterson. I'm an executive producer at Nice Shoes and board secretary of the PNYA. Today's topic is the role of AI in filmmaking, everyone's favorite acronym, AI. And I would, I would dare say ML also. Um, now to introduce our moderator, he's a line producer and post-production manager. He's worked across New York and LA for over 10 years. He's been manager of production and post at Story Syndicate, and he's now at Radical Media on a documentary for Apple. And he is, of course, an active PNYA member. Please welcome Gotham Singani. Hey, guys. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us on the special edition of Post Break. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Chris, Rebecca, and the Post New York Alliance for making this event possible and for supporting our community. So thank you. So today we're going to be exploring a fascinating topic that affects all of us in the entertainment industry, and that's artificial intelligence, and as Chris mentioned, machine learning. You've probably heard a lot about it lately, especially with the writer's strike going on, but did you guys know that AI has been in a hidden forest behind our industry for over two decades now? We're going to go ahead and showcase a little uh, photograph on the screen. And I'm going to share with you three amazing examples of how AI has been used in the past 20 years in some of the most iconic films. On the left, I'm sure you guys remember Avengers Endgame. The post team used an AI algorithm called deep compositing to blend live action and CGI elements seamlessly. This is, I think, uh, just four to six years ago. Even the last Blade Runner film used AI tool from Topaz to enhance the film's visuals and reduce noise in low light scenes. And going way back, we have Lord of the Rings trilogy, which used AI to create massive armies and crowds using software very aptly named Massive. And remember, this is way back in 2001 to 2003, when shooting medium was actually film, not digital. In today's panel, we'll be discussing the role of AI in filmmaking, specifically in post-production, and we hope our conversations will help better understand some of the new technologies in our industry, as well as the benefits of using AI in post-workflows. We'll also be demoing some of the latest AI tools in DaVinci, as well as introducing some new technology from Topaz. So, for, uh, so without further ado, let's introduce the panelists. We have Joey Deanna, DC-based colorist and online editor, and he's also a Blackmagic certified trainer. He'll be demoing for us some of the latest AI tools in DaVinci Resolve. Say hi for us, Dave. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for making the time to join us, Joey. Thank you. Also joining us is Peter Conlin, founder of 1619, Powerhouse VFX, The Foundation, and former executive vice president of innovation and technology at Company3. He's currently an independent producer and virtual production AI specialist. Thanks hey, for buddy. joining us. Hey, everybody. How's it going? And finally, we have Twain Richardson, a finishing editor at Goldcrest and a colorist with whom I've worked with on a few projects at Story Syndicate. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So, uh, Twain, let's dive right straight into it. Um, let's give our audience some context for today's panel on AI. Do you mind sharing the different type of AI tools you use and how that differs from generative AI tools like ChatGPT? Uh, so what I like to call, I like to call it uh, machine learning um, versus um, calling it AI, uh, because in some sense, you still have to uh, feed it um, some form of information. It pretty much is to aid versus, uh, for instance, AI where it's not a case where you're giving it a video and telling, oh, I want you to create a blockbuster look um, for me. And it goes ahead and creates some blockbuster look for you. Um, it's a case of, uh, you know, you have a shot that you need um, some form of um, fixing to be done on it or some form of cleaning up work. Um, and you're telling it to go ahead and, you know, do the cleaning up um, on this shot. Uh, a few tools, AI tools um, slash, you know, machine learning tools that, you know, I've used um day to day is um inside resolve you have like the magic mask um this helps our aids with um rotoscoping um there's a face detection uh, which you can use to organize um your media um so pretty much what it does is that you can tell it to scan all the media that you have in your bin and for instance it will find um all the faces you can then tag them 
Um, and so now you can organize the footage by actors. So you could have a bin for um, Chris, you could have a bin for Joy. Um, and at any time you could jump to you know each um, actor. Um, there's the scene the tech. Um, and what this does is that uh, if you put this on your timeline, it pretty much goes through and it detects where a cut is um, inside uh, your video. Um, I use this a lot of time in finishing, especially when we get, uh, we're asking for a baked file in order to do conform and to color. Um, and we pretty much, we just run this and it goes ahead, it detects all the cuts um, within the timeline. It's a faster process versus having to, you know, receive an XML and having to do a conform. Um, and then the other one that I use a lot of times is the object removal. Um, and what this does is, uh, for instance, if in the shot that you see now up, um, we decided that we wanted to remove the speaker um, that's above my head, um, we could tell Resolve, um, you know, that we want to remove that speaker and, you know, it would go ahead and, you know, use um, the AI to, you know, fill in that area um, with something black. Um, and then also there is Topaz AI, um, which is a software outside of Resolve. You know, it's a tool which we use um, to do a lot of cleaning up work, especially um, for archival material. Yeah, in fact, speaking of Topaz, I'd love to show a clip and talk a little bit more about some of the features that Topaz has to offer. Um, we actually worked on a film together, Twain, uh, Becoming Cousteau, where we leveraged this technology to help with archival footage. I'd love, um, while we have the video on the background, for you to kind of just talk about what different features we use and how we kind of uh, use that in our workflow. Yeah, uh, so one of the things that we did a lot um, for this film was um, we did a lot of upscaling. Um, so we had a lot of 480 material. Uh, we were finishing at UHD. Um, so there's a lot of 480 material that we had to upscale um, to UHD. Um, Topaz, uh, we were able to, you know, bring the media into the software, um, tell it that we wanted to, you know, do the upscaling, do the cleaning up as well. Um, this, uh, it helped us uh, where we didn't have to, you know, go frame by frame or go shot by shot and do all of the cleaning up that, that could have taken, you know, hours um, to be done um, versus where, you know, we tell Topaz that we wanted to do it, we feed it 10, 50 clips. Um, you know, it went ahead and it, it did them in, you know, a relatively short uh, amount of time. Yeah, I have to say what I love about this technology is that it's really taking out all of the grunt work and the repetitive tasks and the manual labor that goes into cleaning up shots. And the fact that it aids in that, it really helps in speeding up the process and making us focus on the important things, the creative decisions that need to be made rather than actually rotoscoping and removing all that film grain or film dust. So thanks so much for sharing all that uh, information, Twain. I really appreciate You're it. You're welcome. You're welcome. We're going to go ahead and introduce Joey. Joey has actually been doing a lot of demos at NAB, and I saw your video recently. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'd love to hear about some of the new AI tools you've been using and how you've been using them in your post workflow. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I'm a colorist and online editor, so I work primarily in Resolve and, you know, Every release of Resolve, they've been adding more and more machine learning tools. It started with just the magic mask tool that Twain talked about. And then that evolved into a very powerful masking and isolation tool. And then recently they've added things like the depth mat and the new relighting tool, which I'll be showing you a little bit later. But for me, you know, the machine learning based tools are really there to augment my existing workflow and to optimize tasks that would normally take a lot of repetitive, boring labor, rotoscoping, masking, skiing, things like that that just take a lot of little nitpicky tweaking and lots of work. The machine learning based tools do a fantastic job just getting that stage in the process done, especially with things like masking. And, you know, that you know, like you guys were talking about earlier, is it makes it easier to focus on the art and the creative. You know, we don't have to sit here tracking masks and rotoing and isolating things that are really difficult to isolate because of the ambient lighting and things like that. A lot of the stuff that I use it for is 
honestly kind of simple time savers. Like if I have a, a shot where maybe I've blurred out a license plate and somebody walks in front of the license plate, you've got a pretty non-linear shape of a person walking in front of something. I can use magic mask to just make a holdback mat really, really quickly. And it'll do a great job. You know, it doesn't, the machine learning tools don't always create like absolutely perfect things like it won't create an absolutely perfect ready for visual effects amazing mat but the cool thing about using it in the context of an overall project is i can then take the mat it gives me manipulate it with my other tools maybe give it some blurring or some shrinking or some adjustment and then get what i need out of it so to me the kind of the strength of any of these machine learning based tools is how well I can integrate it into a real practical workflow and how flexible I can make it by adjusting its result. You know, something that is just drop it on, no settings, no changes. It just gives me an output. Doesn't really help us in the professional post-production world. We need tools that we can integrate into the rest of our workflow. Absolutely. Absolutely agree. I'd love to see these tools in action if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to share my screen real quick and just walk you through a couple examples. So first, the magic mask. This is, like I said, it does generates mats for color correction. So I've got a shot like this, and I've got this shape here, this flower that one goes off the screen, so it would be difficult to track that way. And two, it's kind of a nonlinear shape that moves around a lot. If I were to roto this manually, I would probably end up having to create a different shape for each petal and then one for the center and manually track them. And then when it goes off screen, keyframe it. So if I wanted to use magic mask, the workflow is a little bit different. Instead of actually drawing the mask I want, I want to tell Resolve what a model of the object I want it to find is. So I'm going to draw a big stroke around part of that flower. And I'm just going to turn on highlight so we can kind of see the mask is generating. And it's already gotten a good amount, but because that flower is of a similar color and shape to the hand, it doesn't quite know how to discern them. So I'm gonna switch over to the subtract mode and just draw another stroke on the hand. And the more information I give it, yes or no, basically, you know, this is what I want, this is what I don't want, we can end up with a really good mat. And then once I've got that mat, now this isn't the same as a normal mask or a normal tracker, because I'm not telling it to track these individual strokes. I'm giving Resolve an example of what to look for. So then I'm going to just track that through the shot. And you can see really quickly, it goes through and follows it through the whole shot, including when it goes off the frame. And yeah, if I were to try to remove this object with this mat, it might not be perfect. You can see if I get real close, we've got a little bit of edging going on, but I have a full suite of blur and cleanup and adjustment tools to turn this into a really good mat specific for color correction. And now I can just start adjusting the color of that and if I play it down, since the computer's already done all the hard work of the tracking and the modeling, it's just a mask at this point. It's real time. I can just do anything I want right to that. So the next thing I want to show you with Magic Mask is what I was talking about earlier about uh, holding back things. So here I've got a basic power window where I've isolated and tracked her necklace. But I've got two problems with it, right? One, the shirt goes across it at one point and her hand goes across it. So if I turn that node on and off, you can see I've got all this ugly spill happening here and on her hand. So what I'm gonna do to solve that is just add two layers on top. So essentially I'm putting the original image on top of my correction, and I'm gonna go back to the magic mask, again to add, and first I'm gonna do the shirt. And honestly, I don't have to be very precise here, right? Because I'm only caring about this tiny area where it conflicts with my correction. So I'm just gonna go ahead and track that as it is. That's gonna be good enough to isolate what I'm trying to isolate. And then on my second layer node here, I'm gonna do the same thing with the hand. And I wanna give Resolve, an important thing to remember is I wanna give Resolve as much information as possible to get the best result. So I'm gonna scroll through the shot and try to find where most of the hand is and use that as kind of my starting point. Again, I'm gonna draw some large strokes, just kind of telling it exactly what I want and what I don't want until I've got a model that I'm relatively happy with. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. I can adjust it with blur and softness and shrink and grow later. But really quickly, we've made two rough holdback mats that now if I toggle those on and off, you can see it's saving the hand and the shirt 
from that power windowed correction. Can you imagine trying to roto the fingers and the, you know, distortion of the shirt manually? It's, it's nothing that we couldn't do with conventional tools, but the machine learning tools let me do it in two minutes. Next up, there's another cool little thing that came in the last release of Resolve called the depth mat. What depth map does is it literally took, literally goes and licks, looks at the image and gives you a key channel that corresponds to the depth of the image, white being closer, black being further away. So I can take that and use that to drive color correction. So I'll take that mat and feed it right into a color correction node. And in this case, I'm just gonna invert it. So I'm looking at the back of the image. And if I just do something simple, again, with my conventional grading tools, the big thing here is I am using conventional grading tools for everything and just augmenting them with these, these machine learning tools. If I kind of adjust the contrast a little bit, I can make a nice volumetric fog effect. And as I adjust that depth mat, we can actually adjust the depth and size of that fog right in the node tree in real time. And all of that is based just on the image. It doesn't have any additional information you know it's looking at the image doing a machine learning algorithm to say hey this looks like it's in the front this looks like in the back and we're going to make a mat from it lastly there is what is new in 18.5 the relight tool the relight tool is similar to depth map in that it looks at the image and makes a map of it but in this case, it makes a normal map. So anybody that's done VFX work is going to be familiar with the normals map and what you can do with it. In this case, we can use that to drive relighting. So I can grab different types of light, a point light, a directional light, or a spotlight. In this case, I'm going to grab this point light, and I'm just going to adjust the properties of it. And you can see, as I adjust this, it's actually kind of wrapping around the different shadows and regions of her face. Like we can see where her eyebrow is and where her eyes are. And I can use that as a mat for my normal color correction tool. So if we've got this big shadow here on the top of her face and we wanted to reduce that, I could just bring the gain up for that and watch. So I move it around. You see it kind of follows the contours of her face. So it's built that surface map using the machine learning. And then everything else after that, the relighting is happening using conventional tools for relighting with normals maps and color grading. Lastly, we can use all of these together in a more powerful kind of workflow where I've got a scene here and I wanna do some relighting. So I'm gonna highlight this relighting node that I've already built. And you can see I've got like a good representation of her shape. And one of the really cool things about this is you can actually adjust what they call glossiness and the specularities. So you can really adjust this kind of shape of the material right in the relight tool. And a little bit different than the previous example, I've got my surface map here as a separate node, so I can feed that into multiple lights without having to recompute it every time. Because again, the machine learning part of this is generating that surface map. But my problem with this is if you look at this light, look, it's getting the whole background, it's getting everything in the room, and I want it to focus just on the character in the foreground. So because I'm just in a node-based color environment, I can take one thing, put it to another. I'm gonna adjust a depth map effect, which is kind of what I showed you earlier to generate that fog. Here, I'm gonna use it to limit my relighting tool. So I'll feed that into the mat of the first relighting tool and look at that. Now I'm relighting only the character in the foreground. And if I move that light around in context, we can kind of see it wraps around her as I'm moving it. And then if I wanted to relight the background separately, I could invert that mat, feed it into my second relight, which I've got set as a directional light, and then adjust the color of that light, maybe throw some ridiculous looking blue light on there just for visibility sake. And look at that, it's not affecting her at all because the machine learning derived depth map is separating the two. Uh, and finally, if I'm almost happy with this mat, but it's just a little too aggressive, because at this point, the machine learning side of it's done and it's in a conventional grading pipeline, I can take any other image effect. Like I could do a directional blur, for example, and just blur out that mat that we've derived from machine learning based tools and just kind of smear that light the littlest bit, right? So this isn't a machine learning tool. This is just a regular directional blur. But when applied to the mat from the machine learning tool, we can make these really nice soft relights that still follow the contours 
of the image. So really for me, like I said, it's all about uh, building it into a conventional tool pipeline for one. Two, how do I get it to save me time? What can I do with the machine learning tools that would take me a bunch of time normally and manual labor? And also, once I've got the result from the machine learning tools, how can I harness it and adjust it creatively to get that last 10% to where I need it to be for my final image, right? Instead of just, oh, I'm going to drop the effect on. It was a preset. It's good. I like it or I don't. You know, that's kind of where the difference between these professional tools and some of the more, you know, oh, it's a cool demo, but I can't really use it kind of tools live. Absolutely. That was a fantastic demo. Thank you for sharing that. I, I definitely enjoyed seeing all those tools in action. Um, next, we have Peter. Peter, you've had quite a career in the post industry, and I'd love for you to share with the audience your thoughts on how this is going to shape our industry and how it's reacting to the news and how we can maybe better embrace it uh, in the coming future. Oh, thank you, man. Uh, Joey, that was really cool, that demo. I haven't seen all those uh, updates and resolves. That that was thank you. pretty mind pretty mind blowing. You know, like every the the last six months, just to just to give everybody sort of a sense of things, especially if everybody's been watching the demos. I just was saying this before we started today. You know, we've been working with these AI tools or ML tools and, and all of the new technologies, you, you know, really for the last, you know, five to six years. And these last six months of demos for that we've been showing, sharing with creatives and sharing with people out in the field and sharing with executive producers, like they're all, they've, all these tools are sort of reaching a plateau right now where we're getting like the wow factor where before, like when, when you would look at all these demos, they really were like technical demos. They really were just about the technology. So like, you know, if you're a CTO or a nerd or, you know, like most of us talking right now, like you really liked it. You thought it was really cool, but there wasn't, you know, directors were like, oh, this is cool. Or executive producers, like they were like, oh, I could sort of see doing that. But there's something that's really changed and come to life in these last six months. And, and, it, and, and it's really exciting. Um, so back to what I was charged with here. So yes, I, um, I've had the great good fortune of working in this industry for the last uh, 30 years. I've done just about every job in post-production. I've, I've been a tape op at a giant post house. I've been a union sound editor, a union picture editor, a Foley artist, a location recordist, a business manager, an executive. I've founded four different companies. I've sold some companies, all sort of based around these evolving technologies and the changes that have happened in post-production. You know, if we, as, for a brief history of the last, you know, 25, 30 years, we've had um, a lot of these moments in time where we've had a, a big technology innovation. And everybody from all different directions has a lot of different emotions and feelings about it. You know, like when we first started cutting on the Avid, you know, there was one camp that was like, well, movies and TV shows are all going to suck now because you can edit so quickly and nobody puts any thought into it and edit crews are going to shrink and everyone's going to just like make movies at home on, on, on their, on their couch, you know? And then there was another camp that I was sort of in that, you know, a more excited younger generation that was like, wow, let's learn this new tool. Let's try to apply it. Let's see what's happening, you know? And, Start, it always starts with commercials and then leaks in the TV and then like a really big movie adopts it and we're sort of off and running. Um, you know, that, what really came out of that was, you know, editorial departments were just told, well, instead of just making one cut because we can only cut film, give us nine versions. And because we could put versions together so quickly, we actually needed more assistant crews. We needed to train different people. People needed to learn new tools, but it didn't reduce our industry. It didn't shrink, shrink our industry. You know, the same with like when we first started making digital intermediates, right? And no longer making release prints. Everyone's like, what's gonna happen to every company? What's, you know, all these companies are gonna, you know, go away and people are just gonna do the, 
you know, all the projects on a laptop, right? That's what people always say. And yes, Deluxe and Technicolor no longer could charge everybody for release prints, but we had like 15, 16, 20 new creative shops open in New York in the early 2000s, all of which based around color correcting and making digital intermediates. And these trends sort of keep happening, digital acquisition, really adopting visual effects. And we're sort of at this, we're sort of at this impasse right now. And a lot of people are saying, especially like the Senate hearings, oh, AI is going to take away jobs or it's going to, you know, it's, it's going to challenge us or threaten the industry, you know. And the only thing I can really say to that is in the last 30 years, you know, we've gone from maybe 500 to 1,000 people working in the post-production industry in New York State, New York City and the Tri-State area. And as of 2022, we had 60,000 people working in the industry. You know, there was maybe four companies that you could go work at. You could go to Sal One, you could go to Magno, you go to Duart, or you go to Technicolor, you know? Now we've got 150 companies, you know, all hiring people, all coming up with new technologies. And there's never been more post-production work and there's never been more post-production spending in our industry. You know, there was $24 billion spent on content, which I don't like as a word, but on content creation in 2022, $6 billion of that is spent on post-production, visual effects, finishing, editorial, editorial teams. And so when we, when we, when we hit these exciting times and impasses, I always implore people to really treat it with curiosity and treat it with excitement and look for something new. You know, the, the, the best example that I always use, I was, a, I was a union picture editor and, and I was on the daily staff, the dailies team. So we had three of us in a room, all cutting film from the night before. We had to, you know, get it out of the lab, get the print out of the lab. We had to cut it all up. We had to put it in trim bins. We had to sync the sound to it. We had to build these assembly rolls. We had put it through a coder that blasted these terrible chemicals into our faces. And, um, and once we started shooting nonlinear, like they were like, well, maybe dailies will be done digitally. And maybe all these crews will go away. And like, maybe this will be bad. And people like fought it. They actually still wanted to keep dailies going. All of us on the dailies team did not want to do it that way. And editorial crew shrunk because the dailies teams left. And what happened? Pix was founded, Frame.io was founded. I started a company 1619, Light Iron started a company. All of a sudden we had this new technology of digital dailies and it didn't shrink our industry, it grew it. And the studios spend more on dailies now than they ever spent on it. So each one of these innovations is an opportunity. And I, I think it's just a really important point, especially for everybody that's out there in the industry to never feel threatened you know, by innovations because they keep happening and every time they happen new companies are created the industry grows and it's sort of an exciting time if if you embrace it um i usually get cut off because i talk too long so maybe no i, I love what you just said <laughs> about you know not feeling threatened rather embracing it do you have any suggestions on how, what we can do to kind of embrace these technologies going into the uh, workflows that we'll be having Sure. Yeah. I mean, this comes up a lot. I've been doing the last, the last um, six months, I've been working with a couple of great teams. I don't know if any of you guys know the team at Mesh, um, Ben Baker and James Blevins. And, and um, there's, I've been doing a bunch of consulting jobs with them and, and looking at a lot of different technologies. There's a company showrunner that Sean Cooney started that uh, again is, is in the mix of a lot of these consulting type gigs and, and, and showing things to executives all around the world. And, we get, I get a lot, of, I teach at a couple of different schools and we get a, a lot of young people or like my daughter and her boyfriend are both graduated high school. They're both going to film school next year. And they're like, well, what should we do? And, you know, like you just look at that Resolve demo. You can download a free version or a temp version of, of Resolve and you could learn all those tools, right? Like you could download Unreal. I don't even know the right 5.2 right now, whatever the, whatever the version is. You can take that, watch the first hour of Unreal on YouTube and like, you could build the character, you could rig it to yourself, you could use the AI speech to motion thing and put a microphone to your mouth and rig your tool, you know, like the YouTube and the internet and like these, you know, the, the, 
a lot of the original YouTube video guys or, and gals have sort of turned into like Unreal and AI specialists, you know, making up characters. And uh, Ben Baker at Mesh and I have been meeting with a whole bunch of these guys. There's a guy, Corey Williamson, you can look them up. It's Teflon Sega. Um, I know these names sound weird and I know it's a weird place to look, but like they're creating characters, rigging them to ourselves, building them, building entire environments using all of these AI tools, you know, and, and, and creating unique individual, you know, episodes of content that is watchable and viable and sellable. And like, they sell these characters. They don't sell these characters, like, especially in the kids world, like some of these characters that they, that people like this create, they don't get bought for like 50 bucks. <laughs> they get bought for like a million dollars. And like, there's so much opportunity right now to learn all these things. And every company that we've talked to, Unreal, Resolve, even Avid, like new copycat, like all of the, all of these people, all they want to do is educate. You know, like if you reached out to the education departments of each one of these companies, they would give you software. They would tell you how to train. I mean, Unreal is like free right now. So, you know, if they, what would you do first? Any of those things the only thing not to do is like walk around and say the sky is falling you know like we were we were saying before you know the the for, for me personally in the you know five companies i've started or worked at or been a partner with and the thousands of people that i've worked with you know we've always sort of been curious about technology embraced the change and did that and you know not only is that a, a more in the end profitable way to live but it's so much more fun to live that way you know the the running around and saying the sky is falling and all post companies will go away or post production will end as an industry or all those things. Like who wants to live that way? And it's, it's just, it doesn't ever turn out to be the case. So Absolutely. hopefully that helps. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing those resources. I think that'll be very helpful to our community to just kind of look out um, and play with those tools. So thank you for sharing your insights, Peter. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Awesome. Uh, we have a lot of time open for questions. Um, Chris, would you like to moderate any questions that we have in the chat? Yes, and I encourage everyone to, to drop some questions and we want this to be kind of an informal back and forth, not a, a one way um, lecture format or anything, but some questions we've gotten so far are, um, Chat GPT basically predicts a sequence of tokens slash words. Are we going to see a model that predicts node sequences in Resolve based on the context of the source material in the scene? So is, is Resolve going to kind of adapt to that Chat GPT model, do we think? That's a great question for Joey and Twain. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we're not going to see something like exactly like that because the way a node structure evolves or is built is going to be very specific to what the colorist is trying to do i do think it's more likely that we're going to see an image-based version of that where you have a machine learning tool that will take your original image and do something sort of like the generative tools do where it adjusts it or changes it uh to get a particular look that you describe as a starting point. I could see that happening a lot more than I could see it actually designing a node structure. Cause at the end of the day, the node structure is a visual tool for humans to interact with the image. Whereas the machine learning tools don't really work in that way under the hood, right? So it would be kind of emulating the human interaction to make it. Whereas it would be easier for it to just change the image. Uh, as it were. That definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, the next question is about, are you using this on the free version of DaVinci Resolve or DaVinci Resolve Studio? All of the machine learning based tools in Resolve are studio features. So yeah, the, the free version does not have basically any of the machine learning based stuff. Got it. Um, our next question is from Daph Levy. <clears throat> because of how much machine learning and artificial intelligence have streamlined a lot of the manual labor, how might this impact assistant editors or other post roles that have traditionally completed these tasks? That's a great question. Um, 
I would love to say that there's going to be a lot of changes in the deliverables aspect, but I think Twain uh, could speak a little bit to how this might affect finishing editing. Uh, certainly. So the thing is, you know, AI slash machine learning has been in post for, you know, quite a few years now. Um, I re Resolve added their you know, neural engine, um, I think probably around 2018, 2017, thereabouts. Um, you know, th these are tools that we've been using um, for quite a few years. Uh, for me, um, it's a case of, you know, as Pete said earlier, you know, you learn the tools um, and you use them to be more efficient, um, you know, instead of, you know, instead of spending, you know, um, you know, an hour, um, you know, doing something, you know, I can spend five minutes, um, you know, doing that repetitive task and I can spend the next, you know, 55 minutes, you know, being creative. Um, or I, you know, being able to deliver, um, you know, even faster. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, the tools have been there um, for a while now. Um, it's just a matter of just learning them and using them to your advantage. I can I can answer some add add a little bit to that if you want. You know, it, you know, when you're on a on a feature or a TV editorial team, right, and you're an assistant editor, you know, in in your mind, your your main goal usually is like. I really want to get an episode. I really want to get a scene. I really want to get something to cut as opposed to, you know, handling all of the tasks that you're tasked with in a, in an editorial department, right? Like anybody who's worked in one or managed one, right. And, and Rebecca can really speak to this. Well, you know, as your assistant editor team has so many files to bring in so much to organize, so many things to deliver. Um, that, you know, by the time you would ever get a chance to contribute creatively, potentially, you know, to, to your project, you know, and, and granted, sometimes editors are like, I'm the only one that does it. And that's fine. But there's a, a lot of people that like to give people a crack at cutting a scene and cutting something. You know, a lot of these tools are going to give us more time to do that. And, and the more creative voices that you have in an editorial room, that's certainly how I grew up in independent film, working at the shooting gallery. We were all very, very inclusive and we shared everything and we always had open doors and a lot of us cut in the same rooms together. And it was that there was a real apprenticeship that was going on and people really learned the trade. They didn't just learn how to bring files in and spit them back out. And so the more we can lean on some of these tools, the more creativity I think everybody can bring. And I think that actually might improve a lot of the projects because with our shortened schedules, especially on epi episodics, you can sort of tell the sequences, even in some of the best shows that you love and, and you watch, you can tell when they just didn't have the time for an entire sequence and it just got nailed in. And those are the opportunities that I think assistant editors especially could be like, hey, now that I've got all my dailies organized and I've, you know, I use my machine learning tool to get all these outputs out, right? Wouldn't that be fantastic? Things of that nature. Like, let me take a shot at that for a driving scene for you. You know, let me take a shot at that opening sequence, things like that. So I think that's something that would be, um, um, you know, a, a, a good benefit out of that. And I do see that happening in, in certain editorial departments. Absolutely. And to echo that, like, it's really all about bringing more time to the creative decisions rather than doing the mundane tasks. Um, so we have another question um, regarding Adobe Firefly, actually. Uh, hold on one moment. Can you speak a little bit about Firefly in Adobe? How do editors take advantage of it in the edit? Um, Twain, do you know, uh, do you want to speak a little bit about Adobe Firefly? Um, I've Heard it, I've seen a few videos on it, but I've, to be honest, I've never used it. So not much I can speak to. Um, okay, I'm happy to talk a little bit about it just because I've seen videos myself. And what's fascinating about it is that you can actually type in in a box and have Adobe create uh, assets for you. Um, and what's really cool is that, you know, it's just another way of manipulating content. I don't know if it's necessarily integratable currently into Premiere. Um, but I think there's still some more time for that to develop, but it's really cool nonetheless. Um, our next question, there is text to video, video to text. Isn't client text prompt plus video to primary, secondary parameters a real possibility? Huh. 
there's text to video video to text isn't there a client text prompt video to primary secondary parameters i'm not sure what that means um ryan but feel free to go ahead and message in the chat uh clarification maybe he's asking if you can speak your commands into resolve instead of typing them uh it's no no you can't speak your commands into it uh, what you can do though is that um for instance if you have uh some interviews you can tell it to go ahead and analyze the interviews what resolve will do is it will give you um you know all that was said in that interview uh and you can now pick out points um so for instance if i said the cow jumps over the moon um but he also went under the fence um, and I just wanted that first sentence. I could highlight that first sentence. Um, it will show you where in the interview um, it was said, and I can now put that onto my timeline. Um, and this can help speed up, um, of course, you know, the editing process in that you can now go through your interviews quickly. You can put them, your song bites down on the timeline, and then this now allows you more time to be um, creative. Um, so you can speak it into it, but once the video, um, has um, audio, um, you can analyze that audio. Um, it brings up the text and you can you know, use it from there. That's gonna be very helpful moving forward because typically we used to employ outside vendors like otter.ai to kind of do transcripts. So to have that retained in the uh, editorial uh, editing program is amazing. Um, we have another question, which I think is really interesting. Aside from keeping current and constantly learning, are there other ways to bolster and retain your individual value? Re repeat that, please. Aside from keeping current and constantly learning, I'm sure they're talking about AI and machine learning. Are there other ways to bolster and retain your value as an editor in um, the editorial team? Um, is just being a people person. Um, you know, people like working um, with, with, with people who they like, um, you know, once you're, you know, being helpful, um, I, I'm pretty sure you've, you've, you, you'll be, you know, I heard again. Um, I like to think I'm, <laughs> I'm likable or a people person, you know, I get, you know, mm -hmm. hired back for a lot of projects, uh, rehired for projects. So, um, you know, it's just being helpful, um, you know, and, you know, being a people person. I mean, just to follow up on what Twain said, yeah, I mean, I've always known and said that this is a people business first, and you want to be someone that is collaborative and works with other people on the team and doesn't try to be in a silo. But the cool thing about these machine learning based tools is kind of what Peter was talking about earlier, that they can save you time. And when you have that save time, it allows you to explore other creative avenues and other things in the industry and you can kind of branch out because you're not spending so many hours doing boring repetitive tasks that a robot is better at doing anyway right so if you can take that time saved and use that to invest both in your relationships and your career and your art to you know do better you know one other, especially with editing, it's an iterative process, right? You never get it right on the first cut. Color is the same way. You never get it right on the first pass. You always want to go back and tweak. And the more iterations you do, the better your final result is. You know, they always say that good art is never finished. It's just abandoned because you had to finish. You had to stop at some point, right? By getting some of that extra time back with these machine learning tools, you can do more creative iterations. You can explore the creative side more. And I think that's exciting. I love that explanation. Really appreciate that, Joey. Um, I love this question. What software do we feel is leading the charge in machine learning and AI? I what well, what well, I I use Resolve the most. I, I <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say Resolve. Um, especially I think there's, I think right now there's probably about a good 15 to 20 um machine learning features you'd say joy um so yeah, yeah that, that sounds about right i mean i'm obviously very partial to resolve as well so i would i would say that they're they're really doing innovative stuff and like i touched on earlier the 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 hallmark of the good machine learning tools are the ones that you can really use in a flexible workflow not ones that lock you into doing one set of i like it or i don't like it based on the output 
Absolutely. We have a, a really great question um, about VFX. And I actually would love to gauge the audience's interest in doing a future post break on some of the other utilizations and um, ways to use AI in other fields, such as VFX, sound. Um, I'm actually very interested in deliverables myself. Uh, there is a company that's now streamlining, creating all of your archival uh, and like all the other deliverables that you need to provide your distributor at the end of your film. And by taking away some of the time that's um, spent in building these huge Excel spreadsheets, I think is really great uh, for our team to kind of focus on the important tasks. So I'd love to hear in the chat any other topics or any other uh, departments you'd like to see AI being used in. Yeah, I can I can say for sure there there's enough information out there to be able to do a a full hour at least on each. You know, you know, visual effects, you know, obviously has the most um, software. I would say functioning the at at the highest level right now. You know, everything everything that you just saw in Resolve is is, is available and and so much more. Especially when we talk about starting to create digital assets. You know, for um, shooting in LED um, volumes or, or, you know, just the, the process by which digital assets are either scanned and then cleaned up or, you know, created, you know, with generative AI, you know, from scratch. Um, I, I think a good, a good hour and, and a lot of the different um, current visual effects teams that are sort of living it right this second um, would, would be a good one. And just back to that software question, you know, that's like an impossible question to answer right now. Like there's, I'm just looking down this list right now and maybe we could post it after, but I mean, there's at least a hundred plus companies, different softwares right now that are sort of being deployed across our post spectrum. And each one of them is improving at a very very fast rate so it's like the latest release is who's leading the charge <laughs> like it's really things are changing that quickly and in terms of the versioning and delivery as you know there's some people that are very passionate about that i myself am one of them it's a very odd thing to be passionate about um but the ability to localize and versionize version our all our different projects is is maybe one of the hardest, most time consuming parts of our industry. And that if we could condense that and make that go away, and there are some great tools doing that, I think everybody who is passionate about it, which granted is a very small subset of the population of this planet. Um, would uh, will applaud what's coming, and I think spending some time on that would would be cool, you know, in the future. Yeah, versioning is actually a very fascinating topic. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to, you know, uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to all. call you. I didn't mean to call you a nerd, dude, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, people yeah. are asking. Uh, asking what is the name of the program that I was mentioning in regards to the uh, deliverables. It's called ME Suite, M-E-S-U-I-T-E. -E. Um, they've got some great programs. And what's really cool about them is that they have all the distributors deliverable templates pre-installed. So you don't necessarily need to do any grunt work. You just have to give them the final output uh, and, your, um, and your EDL and that's it. And it will spit it all out for you. It's amazing. Agreed. It's really cool. Yeah, I agree. We have one last question. What about the prospect of completely synthesized video for commercials and short form content? It's interesting. I saw I mean, recently uh, a commercial for Coca-Cola and people were commenting, wow, like this is completely generative AI. What I think people failed to see is that it took <laughs> many, many teams to come up with that concept and execute it. Though it is based upon AI, I think it's fantastically done. I think it's negating all the work that humans put to put that. Um, I'd love to hear some other thoughts on that. 
there's like a thousand people that worked on that commercial. So that wasn't, that's not created by its, by an AI tool itself. You know what I mean? There's loads and loads and loads of, of work that's gone on to, to take the, all of those assets and put that into a commercial and make that yet yeah, the images are generated themselves initially from, you know, a generative AI type tool, but the putting, the picking of it, the putting it, of it together, the, the cleaning up of it and the actual building of it was, was a pretty massive group. I, there's, there's something out, there's someone out there in LinkedIn, I think that, that broke down some of the amount of people that actually worked on it. And we could try to find that, but it, it wasn't just someone pressed a button and that and some and an AI program made that it, it couldn't that couldn't be farther from what actually happened. Absolutely agree with that is what I've read. I don't know for sure. I don't work at Coca-Cola <laughs> or, or who made whoever made it. Um, we have another question. Uh, basically challenging the use of machine learning versus AI. They state that hasn't the learning already happened when Blackmagic designed train resolve to recognize user strokes, surfaces and depths. And when the user places a stroke for creating a mat, that is likely typing a prompt into chat GPT. The software then analyzes the content and executed a task. That is AI, agree or disagree? I think I can kind of speak to that a little bit because I'm on one of the teams of I never say AI. I always say machine learning. And granted, it is a little bit of a pedantic thing. You know, AI, machine learning, deep learning. There are many marketing terms for this category of technology. Uh, the reason why I like to say machine learning, not AI, is because there is no actual machine-based intelligence making decisions, right? At the end of the day, these huge machine learning models generate a gigantic tree of if statements, right? So when you give it an input, it goes through these billions of different if statements to qualify its output. And this is all based on the, the learning process that happened beforehand. Uh, and then it gives you an output, right? But there's not any actual intelligence or thinking happening. And I, I I know that's a little pedantic, but also I think that should help alleviate some of the fear mongering that we've seen of, yeah, we're all going to lose our jobs to this. And no, it's a tool like anything else. It's a very complicated and advanced tool, but I, I don't think of it as actually being artificially intelligent. I think that's more kind of a sci-fi movie term. Agreed. It is definitely. Um... We have a question from Lucian. Uh, many of these AI tools coming out are web-based. Will this encourage more remote work? I think it absolutely will, um, but I would love to hear some thoughts from the panelists. I mean, I think everybody at this point, there isn't a task. There are a few tasks that can't be completed in post-production remotely. So, you know, when heading into the pandemic, there was a lot of things that hadn't been worked out about cloud processing and, and uh, keeping our things in the cloud and how we distributed those networks around and how we streamed, you know, high res video. All of those things we figured out. So, you know, the question really becomes, you know, do people want to keep working remote? And, you know, there's, there's some people that do and some people that don't. And so it's going to become much more of a personal preference thing. You know, if, if a lot of key decisions need to be made, you know, I've always found that's a very, um, that's a terrible use of everyone being remote. Everyone is sending cuts around. People are annotating and giving comments on different things and nothing gets accomplished. You know, it's good to have everybody in the theater all making final decisions. You know, if updates have to happen and things have to change and you're, and you're working in multiple uh, time zones and locations all around the world and everybody everybody needs to be contributing as you're sort of building the project before you get to all the final decision making those are excellent uses of remote so you know promoting more remote i think we we're, we're sort of there in the sense that we can remote almost anything right now i think it's sort of how are our teams really interacting both socially and sort of productive wise on on how close we're going to be to each other i 
I'm a strong believer that for the final moments of finishing projects, final mixes, final color sessions, final visual effects approvals, all of those things are so much more productive when we're all together in big creative spaces looking at each other so we can hash these things out. I also like free lunch. I also like free lunches. So, I mean, it's just one that, you know. I absolutely agree. Thanks for that, Peter. Um, we are nearing the end of our post break, and I just want to take this time to thank everyone for showing up. This was a fantastic panel, and I really appreciate everyone's time. Um, we hope you learned a lot from our conversation and realize that this is something that's worthy of embracing and nothing to be afraid of. Um, special thanks to our panelists, Peter, Joey, and Twain, and thank you guys for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Gotham. Thank you, everyone. Bye. See you in bye June. Bye.